Hello and welcome to today's channel cast, Future Proof Your Data Center with Panduit and Cisco, sponsored by the channel company in Panduit. My name is Ed Hannon and I'm excited to be moderating today's channel cast. First, to ensure you in the audience get the most from today's event, I have a few announcements and suggestions for you. At any time, you're free to ask questions of our presenters. And you can submit those questions by typing them in the Q&A box in the top right-hand corner of the console. Second, the presenters will advance the slides for you automatically, so you don't have to do anything except listen and take in the presentation. And you can also download a copy of today's slides by clicking on the Downloads button, which is also located in the top right-hand corner of the console. And finally, if you have any technical problems, you can let us know by clicking on the Help button located in the top right-hand corner of the console. And joining me today are Robert Reed, Engineering Development Strategy Manager, Data Center Connectivity Group with Panduit, and Pat Chow, Product Manager, Transceiver Modules Group with Cisco. And I'm going to turn it over to Pat in a couple of minutes, but first I want to talk for just a minute or two about sort of the market that we're in, that we're dealing with today, some of the technology and some of the opportunity that awaits you for those of you who want to uh, take a, a bit deeper dive, you know, into some different options with solutions uh, for your partners, for your customers. So again, uh, you know, the, in the world we live in right now, it's, uh, things are very uncertain and very, you know, very different than they were a few months ago, and they'll probably be this way for a while. So what, we've, what we're seeing is basically, you know, everyone is, is, you know, living, breathing, working, doing everything out of their house right now, um, as, you know, as we, were, as we uh, you know, are putting on today's program. So what is it that's bringing us together? Well, consider, you know, Face-to-face -face meetings are happening remotely, and our, our children are learning through digital classrooms. And you know, we binge watch TV shows and even latest movies that are would have been theatrical theatrical releases from our houses. And you know, it's it's a different world. I mean, we're, we basically brought the world we live in into our house. And I, I thought this quote from a, a, a you know a, a prof, you know an expert at Brookings was pretty interesting. That all this internet use is putting more pressure on our broadband infrastructure. And you know, uh, the gentleman argues that COVID-19 uh, presents an opportunity really to explore our broadband capability and better use our current bandwidth while preparing for a digital future. So the question is, how do we make that happen? And, you know, it's, it's you know, so when we talk about this future that's, you know, more digital than what we're living in now, and we move even farther down this road with, you know, with te technology and the importance of remote connectivity, it's really no surprise that something like the optical fiber, fiber market would be doing as well as it does, and it's even looking even better going forward. And I pulled some numbers here, and, I, you know, there's different methodologies that different analyst firms use to measure these types of markets. So don't get hung up so much on the numbers for, like, the years. It's more the percentage growth from point A to point B. And you can see here, you know, across the, across the board, whether it's allied market research, it's studied, you know, from 2018 to 2025, or markets and markets that studied from 2019 up to 2024, or Grandview Research, which also did 2018 to 2025, you see compound annual growth rates for billion-dollar markets that are anywhere from 5 to 10 or even more you know, percent per year. So when you have a market that's that big, but it's growing that much year over year, you can see that there's opportunity now, and there's going to be even more opportunity going forward. So you know that this is somewhere you want to be and that your customers are going to be sort of coming to you with looking for solutions. So the question then is sort of, you know, what's making this, this all happen? What's driving all this growth? Um, some of the editors uh, from our site, CRN, uh, you know, they looked at data, some data center trends and technologies to keep an eye on them this year, 2020. And just a few, you know, real quick ones that jumped off the page for me were, you know, seeing things like enterprises changing their data center strategy. And again, this was put together before COVID-19. So, you know, the strategies that people thought they'd be using six to nine months ago are even going to be different now. And, you know, as, as we get from the summer and spring into the fall and we're looking, you know, into the next year, who knows where this is going to go. But, you know, you see things like data center as a service getting real traction and this, this idea of innovation driving even more sustainable data centers. So the question is, we know where this is going. We know the market's going in a certain direction in terms of growth and some of the trends and the technologies, but how do you get there? Well, when your customers come to you and they want to, you know, make their data center strong enough to, to handle today's load, but also tomorrow's demands, where are you going to turn for a solution? Well, there's a, there's a vendor out there whose partner program offers things like sales and marketing solutions, training tools, uh, you know, best-in-class value, joint financial growth, where you, you know, where everybody wins, 
in performance-based rewards. So, and also, you know, as you're going to learn over the next few minutes, you get the benefits of working with not only Panduit, but also with Cisco. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Pat and then Robert to tell you more about it. And uh, Pat, take it away. Thank you, Ed. Hello, everyone. My name is Pat Chow, and I am a uh, product manager at Cisco. Uh, Robert and I are going to be talking about uh, future-proofing your data center. When you migrate from uh, migrate, migrating 40G to 100G with uh, both Panduit and Cisco. So, um, just a quick uh, bio slides for us. Robert Reed is a uh, engineering development strategy manager in the data center connectivity group at Panduit, and as I mentioned, I'm a product manager in the transceiver modules group at Cisco. Sometimes we call ourselves Cisco Optics. Um, that's basically the transceiver modules group. So I'm going to kick off our presentation uh, by first talking about a way to use the same fiber infrastructure, whether you're using 10G data rates or 100G or anywhere in, or anywhere in between. And then I'll talk about um, a similar method to upgrade to 100 gig from 40 gig data rates incrementally. And I'll get into what that means. Uh, and then I'll hand it off to Robert where he's going to talk about how to minimize your operational risk, uh, risks um, that are due to uh, contamination in your connectors and then also how to minimize the pathway consumption, uh, which will impact the total cost of your installed cable. So to start off, uh, I'm going to talk about mainly a, uh, a particular transceiver. It's, uh, for short, we call it BiDi. It's a duplex multimode fiber dual rate QSP28 form factor transceiver. Uh, the dual rate means that it operates at both 40 and 100 G. So this is a transceiver that's very well suited for data center applications, specifically between the spine layer and the leaf layer. Now, the spine leaf architecture is very popular in data centers because it's two layers, and it connects pretty much uh, every spine switch to every leaf switch. And the reason that's important is that um, any traffic that's going from ser one server to another server only has to go through one hop. So you go to the, the leaf switch, uh, and you can go to the spine switch, and then from there you go directly to the other leaf switch where the server is connected. So that's just one hop. And that minimizes latency, which is very important because these days, 85% of traffic in data centers is east-west. So, so that means server to server, basically. And um, uh, the, the other traffic, the northwest traffic, base, uh, the north-south traffic, uh, which basically is between the servers and the end users, um, you know, that's, that's the remaining 15%. Most of the traffic is east-west, uh, and that's, you know, you have a lot of application-to-application -application data flowing. Um, there's been a lot of virtualization in recent years, uh, virtualized LANs, virtualized servers. So that's driving all this traffic, and of course with data centers, you want to minimize uh, the computation times and, of course, latency will kill you. So the least spine architecture is perfect for data centers. The BiDi transceiver would fit very well between the leaf and spine because it's a short reach transceiver and the reach being about 100 meters for uh, OM4 multimode, multimode fiber, for instance, um, that's more than enough for pretty much all the uh, all the leaf spine uh, interconnects that you would see in a, in a typical data center. Now, BiDi is not the only short reach multimode fiber transceiver. There's also SR4. SR4 refers to a IEEE standardized optical interface specification. Um, the main difference between SR4 and BiDi is that SR4 uses ribbon multimode fiber which means you have to use MPO connectors. And BiDi uses duplex multimode fiber, which means you can use LC connectors. Um, at Cisco, we have uh, two, uh, uh, two versions of SR4, one at 100 gig data rates, and actually three different flavors of the other version at 40 gig. Um, for BiDi, we have a, a 40 gig native uh, transceiver, and then the 100 gig uh, the 100, 100 gig data rate BiDi transceiver actually operates at 40 gig as well. So again, it's dual rate. Now, 
Now, the thing that's interesting about uh, the bi dye being duplex multimode fiber is that if you compare it with the 10 gig SFP SR transceiver or 25 gig SR, um, these are, are in SFP form factors. Uh, if you were to upgrade from a 10 gig transceiver uh, uh, or a network data rate uh, in your links, you would be using duplex multimode fiber. Um, 10 gig SR is basically a duplex uh, format, and you'd be using the duplex LC connectors. So if you were to upgrade to um, 100 gig or 40 gig using SR4, for instance, you would have to use uh, the ribbon fiber, which means you'd have to add more fiber because ribbon fiber has multiple pairs of fiber in it, and that's required by SR4. Um, having the multiple pairs of fiber requires you to use a different connector, uh, MPO, which, uh, as Robert can explain later, is going to impact um, you know, the ease of which you can clean these connectors, and it'll impact your risk of contamination. The nice thing about bi dye is that using duplex MMF and duplex LC connectors, it's the same fiber infrastructure as the 10G or the 25G SFP-based uh, uh, transceiver, um, uh, the fiber infrastructure based on the, the 10G uh, data rates. So basically, if you want to upgrade, if you're starting on the left-hand side here, if you're starting with 10G SFP plus based uh, uh, SR links, uh, if we follow these arrows to the different choices of migration path, um, if you want to go to 100 gig or 40 gig using SR4, you'd have to add more fiber, as I mentioned. You'd have to be using MPO connectors. Um, the the MPO connector itself has uh, 12 fibers in it, even though the SR4 uses only eight of those. So depending on how you install uh, or, or your configurations, uh, you may actually be wasting fiber. Um, however, if you upgrade to a 40 gig bi die, the second arrow there, um, you'd be using the same duplex multimode fiber. Uh, or if you upgrade to the dual rate 100 gig bi die, like even if you operate at 100 gig, you're using the same duplex multimode fiber. The only difference might be um, the, the 10 gig reach is actually uh, a bit longer than the 40 gig and 100 gig reaches of the bi die. But uh, you know, even at 100 gig, uh, at uh, over OM4 fiber, the 100 gig bi die gives you 100 meters. And for data center applications, uh, it's very rare that you would need more than 100 meters. So the other nice thing about the bi die is that it's dual rate, which means that you can upgrade your network from 40 gig to 100 gig incrementally. And what I mean by incrementally is that uh, you, you don't have to swap out all the gear on both sides of the link at the same time. So you may have restrictions, um, you know, you may have limitations on resources. Um, uh, maybe budget, or maybe um, your team is just not large enough to do everything all at once. Um, and if you had, you know, if that takes more time, then you, you'd have your link down for a long time. So if you do one side at a time, uh, you can minimize your downtime. So let's step through the the different phases here. And the diagram at the top, you can see we're starting out with uh, your legacy 40 gig switches with the 40 gig bi die installed. And when you start your upgrade path, uh, on the left-hand side, we swap out the switches with new 100 gig switches, which also support 40 gig data rates. We plug in this dual rate bi die, and on the right-hand side, we haven't touched it yet. So we can bring the link back up again and run it at 40 gig. Then later, when we have the resources or the schedule or the time, then we upgrade that other side, again doing the same thing. We swap in the network gear with 100 gig ports. Um, we use the same 100 gig dual rate bi die. And then we can bring up the link uh, at 100 gig data rate, which is the end goal. Uh, the, the nice thing is that uh, even though in the middle step we were still at 40 gig link, it's better than being down for all that time. So. Uh, this offers a lot of flexibility, which customers have um, have really loved. 
Now, just one more thing I want to say about the 100 gig uh, buy die. Uh, looking ahead, 400 gig uh, is actually um, right on top of us. And what you'll see pretty soon is a 400 gig SR4.2 QSAP DD uh, transceiver. Um, this is something that uh, will also be four channel, like the uh, SR4 at 40 gig and 100 gig. But there's interoperability with 100 gig buy die. So again, if you wanted to upgrade incrementally, for example, uh, or if you wanted to uh, connect a high density spine switch um, with your leaf switches with 100 gig ports, you have this uh, you have this interoperability with 400 gig if you use buy die. So that's also a very valuable uh, a valuable feature of buy die. So with that. I'll hand it off to Robert. Hey, thanks, Pat. Um, the first thing I'm going to talk about uh, is a product that's unique to Panduit. As you can see on the slide here, it's patented. It's a uh, chromatic dispersion compensated fiber. I know that's a lot to, to take in. But what, the, in effect, what this fiber does is enhances the capability of BiDi in particular. Um, Cisco publishes reaches for OM3 and OM4 fiber. We we'll call this OM4 signature core fiber. And those reaches are based on um, total connector loss in a channel. So what's published on the Cisco websites and in their materials for these modules for 40 gig the the total connector insertion loss is one db um, and for 100 gig the total insertion loss is 1.5 db at those insertion losses you can see respectively 40 and 100 gig reaches at 150 meters and 100 100 meters so what signature core does this fiber technology uh, it's fully intermatable with OM3 and OM4, but it allows you longer reach, typically about 25, 30% longer reach. And even though there's a lot of coverage with um, those multi-mode solutions for most data centers, you know, probably 95% of the links are under 150 meters. Um, there are links that customers have that hop through multiple pieces of connectivity across the data center that push the limits. So this is just a tool that allows you uh, extended reach. I'm going to dive into um, extrapolating a bit on Pat's slide, showing in a little bit more detail the impact of migrating from 40 to 100 gig in particular, starting at 10 gig and migrating to 40 and 100 gig in particular, the two different ways that Pat talked about. Uh, SR4, which as he mentioned, uh, requires a lot more fiber um, using eight fibers, or in most cases, people select 12 fibers and four fibers are dark. Uh, that's the blue area here. You're seeing a migration from two fiber infrastructure to this eight or 12 fiber infrastructure. So at a minimum, you're adding four times the amount of fiber, connectors, panels, and all the associated gear. And I'm gonna end this discussion really with a cost model that shows the cost of building Greenfield, an SR4, uh, array fiber with MPO connectors versus the uh, SR10G and then you know migrating to 20G and 50G. Here's a little bit more detail on what happens when you go from 10G uh, to 40 and 100G with SR4. So you're you're basically going from serial duplex to um, parallel parallel optics. And what I'm representing here is a typical channel, a plug and play channel 
uh, using two cassettes in the top that are interconnected with a 12 fiber ribbon connector, MPOs on either end. You plug that cord into the back of the cassettes. And what that gives you is six duplex port, six duplex ports uh, that can service six SR uh, channels, 10G SR channels. When you migrate, the only thing that's recyclable is that one MPO to MPO cord that plugs into the back of the cassettes. Because now you've swapped over to parallel optics. Now you have to buy, if you want to do port for port migration, where you have six 4100G channels, um, you have to buy, obviously, all new equipment cords. So there's 12 new equipment cords. Um, sure, you've, shaped, you've saved that one trunk, which you're going to plug into MPO cassettes. Those are shown on the bottom. But to support those six SR4 channels, you have to add uh, four, uh, five MPO to MPO cords. So this is this is a big cost savings if you don't have to recycle the cable plant. And now what we've got is the preferred way that Pat showed in blue here is taking that cable plant and not doing anything. So on the left-hand side there, you've got 10G transmit, 10G receive. Those same fibers are capable of 20G by dye so basically one color in one direction, one color in the other direction, times two fibers, 40 gig, or 50 gig by dye so 50 gig in each direction over a single fiber times two fibers, which you have because you recycled the 10G cable plant. So this, the message here is that there's no change in the cable plant. So that 10G SR, um, SR cable plant with plug and play. Um, basically, you plug in the, the transceivers and you're good to go, albeit at a shorter reach, as, as Pat mentioned, you know, 100, 150 meters, which we can stretch out with signature core, you know, out to, uh, you know, 200 and something meters for 40 gig and 150 meters for the 100 gig by dioptic. The one thing that I will say is, you know, I've been in the, the fiber industry for a number of years. When you do SR4 and you bring MPO to the panel and the data center personnel are now doing moves, adds, and changes with MPO connectors that are big and contamination prone, the inspection and the cleaning of, of those, which causes, you know, 50 to 60 percent of the problems in in channels, uh, the physical infrastructure. Um, it's not straightforward. And the tools that are out there, I would call them emergent for doing so. The inspection tools and the cleaning tools typically look at the contact area of the connector and don't necessarily clean all the parts of the connector that uh, you need to get full physical mating of the connector. So I would call MPO connectors in general, they're great if you plug it into the back of a, a cassette, like shown here, and you test it at the LC level. But if you're talking about inspection, cleaning, and testing at the MPO level, where the MPOs are at the, at the panel, it's problematic. It's not straightforward. If I look at building these links, um, serial duplex, uh, you know, 10G SR or 40 or 100G by die. Um, I'm using that, that top model there where I've got a cassetted system uh, serviced by a single 12 fiber MPO trunk, one, one 12 fiber MPO trunk, um, two six port cassettes, and six L LC jumpers on each side. So that will do. 10G all the way up to 100G. And if I want to do a direct installed cost comparison to SR4, 40 or 100G, I have to add six uh, 12 fiber MPO trunks, or I have to add five if I migrate, 
but outright, if I build this greenfield, I have to have six MPO trunks. I have to have six MPO couplers. Those are typically in a modular panel of six. And then I have to add six MPO jumpers on either side. So what I did was I looked at um, a cost comparison of building this greenfield for a leaf spine, uh, basically having a interconnect panel at each end, uh, a patch panel at each end with jumpers for the leaves and jumpers for the spines. And I looked at bide eye technology with serial cabling, plug and play cassettes, breakout cassettes versus pure SR4 parallel optics. And if I look at the transceiver costs, it's kind of a wash between bi die and SR4 these days. Uh, so really, the main difference is in the cable plant, what the, what the installed cost of the cable plant is. And my calculations here for um, a leaf spine using uh, 384 interconnects as a model for the spine leaf uh, architecture, I, I, I get a 79% savings in cable plant supporting bi die over SR4 if I purpose build the cable plant for bi die or SR versus SR4. The other advantage that we don't often talk about is pathways. So typically these uh, switches are not co-located. Uh, you're you're going to have to run cable through a pathway, manage the cable coming out of enclosures and so forth. And what I, what I did, and this is just a, uh, a fiber runner pathway, uh, that's our, our trade name. And what I did was I doubled the amount of uh, cords to fill up the pathway uh, to make a representation. So I doubled the number to 768 for the links. And to make it more realistic, you don't typically go point to point with an MPO cord. You'll bundle that up in a trunk cable and have uh, let's say a 48 fiber trunk cable with four MPOs on each end. So this is representative of the size uh, sectionally of those 48 fiber uh, trunk assemblies. And then what I did was I took the same pathway and did the uh, cross-sectional area, which is basically one sixth, because each one of the 48 fiber trunks uh, supports six times four uh, bi die or SR links because the cassette is six channels and I've got four MPOs on each trunk uh, supporting um, four cassettes on each side, basically 24 uh, channels. And thinking a little bit further, I said, well, you know, it takes time and money to lay those cables inside of pathways and deal with all of these different elements, you know, basically plugging connectors into the back of MPO panels or into the back of uh, breakout cassettes. Uh, and there's a certain amount of labor associated with, um, you know, laying cable and pathway and managing cable into enclosures and so forth. So I built, I built a simple uh, cost model. Uh, your mileage may vary, but I said, okay, the contractor labor per hour, I think this is pretty representative of data center um, skilled contractors. I said $85 per hour. And you could argue this, but I, I broke it down into staging cable, paying out the cable, laying cable in the pathway, dressing out the cables in the transitions from the pathways and into the enclosures. Uh, doing link testing on uh, all of these uh, elements and then cleaning and inspecting. And that's really with link testing, you're doing cleaning and inspecting. Uh, and what I came up with was just one versus the other in terms of pathway installation of the cabling, management of the cabling and validation of the links that you've built. I look at about a 63% savings which is big. Um, so summary, uh, just restating what we talked about as an agenda starting was 
using, there's power in using the same fiber infrastructure from 10 gig all the way up to 100 gig. Now there may be instances where the reach of an application is outside of the reach of um, by dioptics, even with signature core. And in those cases, not applicable, not applicable but um, most cases, probably high 90% of data centers um, are gonna be 150, 100 meters or below. Upgrading from 40 gig to 100 gig incrementally, as Pat mentioned, you know, uh, command interface changing, um, changing with the same dual rate optic without touching the infrastructure. Uh, I touched a little bit on the risk uh, of contamination of an NPO connector, particularly at the panel where a technician has to interface with it. And as, I, as I'll reinforce that technology for inspection, cleaning, and particularly testing is emergent and nowhere on par with the simplicity of inspection, cleaning, and testing of LC connectors, for instance. And I did present a, a pathway consumption model, cost model, which is pretty compelling. And the total installed cost of Greenfield cable plant uh, SR versus SR4, which is also pretty compelling. And with that, I'm gonna end with questions. Well, thank you both so much, uh, Robert and Pat. I really appreciate it. We'll, we'll, we'll do a couple of quick questions there before we go. Um, and I, I don't know who wants to take it, but you, you both covered a lot of ground here today. What would be sort of the most important really takeaway um, from today's program that people should be left with? I, I, can, uh, I can address at least the transceiver portion. Uh, I think the most important takeaway is just the, the bi-die transceiver really allows you to uh, avoid having to make huge uh, investments in uh, additional fiber and the cable infrastructure and, con and connectivity. Yeah. Can I amplify that a bit? Um, of course. So for those applications that are within the reach of bidioptics with signature core, um, there is no simpler or lower risk cable plant or lower cost cable plant than serial duplex with LC connectors at the panel, presenting the most easily inspected, cleaned, and tested interface. Excellent, excellent, excellent. And then uh, I also, I think this is an interesting one too. What is the... Um, What's the first thing that people should do, um, you know, when they get up, when you know, when they get off this program today? What's the first thing that they should do to act upon the information that they now have? Um, I mean, I can, again, I can give my perspective. Um, I, I think people should uh, just consider where they're at right now, in terms of uh, you know their network uh, capacity and which data rates they're they're running and their links, and then consider what's the migration path forward and what, you know, where the pain points are. So like with the incremental upgrade paths with a dual rate feature, um, you know, if, if you're okay taking your network down for a while, then maybe that's not such a big deal. But in our experience, that's actually very important to, to most data center operators. Um, so they can always go to uh, a host of resources uh, that Cisco offers, and I'm sure I'm sure Panduit does as well, uh, to get more information about what options that they have. Yeah, and again, I'm going to amplify that. I see Bidai for multi-mode as the go-to for uh, 400G, and Pat touched on breakout with 400G to 100G Bidai. That's the first step, but given that people are um, familiar with, I call them base eight uh, cable plant um, using MPO. Uh, eventually, you're going to have to go to that. I think the beauty of BiDi is it puts off the uh, migration to said 
uh, until you jump to 400G. And I, I see 400G as the most viable, 400G buy die as the most viable optic uh, for 400G. Excellent, excellent. Well, thank you both. So um, with that, we're gonna wrap this up and I'm gonna let everyone know that as we do that, uh, just let me move the uh, slide over to the closing slide here. Just a thank you slide. And just let everyone know that today's channel cast and its, copy, can its content rather are copyright 2020 by the channel company LLC or its affiliates. All rights are reserved and all trademarks are the property of their respective owners. Any rebroadcast or redistribution of today's channel cast or any portion thereof without the prior written consent of the channel company LLC is prohibited. And I just want to thank you all again for attending today's channel cast brought to you by the channel company and Panduit. And also on behalf of my guests, Robert Reed and Pat Chow and our virtual production team. Thanks so much for your time. Enjoy the rest of your day. And remember, please stay safe, everyone.